for joining us on Promising Me Unleashed with our guest, the Dr. Diana Lake. Dr. Lake is a board-certified emergency medicine physician. She is also the creator of Dr. Die Fitness. Let's jump right into this conversation as she shares her journey to becoming a doctor and how she is empowering others to take control of their life and health. Dr. Lake, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Yes, I am thoroughly excited. I almost don't know where to start (laughs) because you are probably one of the most diverse people I know. So I am really, really excited. So I just want to start from the very beginning to talk about what drove you or motivated you first to become a physician and then to become an emergency medicine physician? That's a great question. So actually, I remember this conversation too with my mother. I remember I was 14 Mm -hmm. and I I had started, you know, I I started high school early because I had gotten a couple of promotions in elementary that pushed me ahead and in Liberia if you were mastering the the work and they saw you were doing well they would just move you to the next grade you wouldn't wait the whole year to be promoted and so I went from second to fourth grade in one year wow so by 14 I was already in the 11th grade that's that's I'm giving you the backstory so you understand how I ended up being 14 and in the 11th grade (laughs) so I'm in the 11th grade, 14, and basically we're talking about college, and I was going to be coming to the United States from Liberia for college. So we're talking about it, and so my mom's like, you know, so what do you want to do? What do you think you want to do, right? We're having this conversation because I'm about to go into my 12th, you know, my 12th year um, of school in high school. So because I knew I wanted to travel a lot, I told her I wanted to be a flight attendant. (laughs) And she was like, I don't think that was going like, too well. Why did, why did you say, <laughs> right? She was like, why'd you say that? And I said, because they go all over the world. And she right. was like, well, you know, they take people <laughs> all over the world. Exactly. But they're not staying and vacationing that this is, they're just taking people there. Right. And I was like, oh, that doesn't sound as exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and then she's like, well, what else do you want to do? Mm-hmm. And so that's how the whole conversation about becoming a doctor came up. I remember that conversation so vividly. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, I know I want to do something that helps people, right? That was my first thing. And I said, I wanted to be my own boss. Don't tell me, don't ask me why. (laughs) I knew I wanted to work for myself. Uh And I think what happened there was my mother, before she got pregnant with me, was planning to go to nursing school. Wow. And then she got pregnant with me and she got married all in the same year and ended up not going to nursing school. So she kind of was pushing her dream on me. Right, right. <laughs> and she was like, well, you know, I wanted to do nursing. I didn't end up doing nursing, mm-hmm. but you're really good in the sciences. What do you think about that? And so the conversation just kind of went down that road and we ended up talking through it. And I said, well, I'm going to be a doctor. Wow. That's how that came about at age 14. And so we talked about it, talked about what that would look like, Mm -hmm. talked about how long it would take, right? right? Um, And what it would, what the process would look like from going to college to going to medical school Mm -hmm. and then deciding on a specialty once medical school was done. Because it's a 12 year thing, right? right? You know, after high school, there's four years of medical school. I mean, there's four years of college, college right. and then there's four years of medical school. And then after that, you specialize in whatever it is you specialize in, which could be another three years or seven years, right? It goes Long from commitment. three to seven, depending on what, yes, depending on what you choose to specialize in, it could be three years, mm-hmm. or if it's newer surgery or plastic surgery, or, you know, one of the other ones, it could be seven years. Right. So it's a long process. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was the basically how I decided I was going to do it. Mm-hmm. And then the thing about medicine is once you decide, it's just like a pipeline. 
you just you know it's like you do this then you do this then you do this and (laughs) exactly Mm -hmm. it just takes you through a pipeline Mm -hmm. and so that's what I did and when it was time to decide on a specialty I wanted to do OBGYN okay believe it or not (laughs) (laughs) so I wanted to be a women's health person it was my you know I, I lived in New York I was a big women's health you know, uh, advocate. I did Planned Parenthood in the summers, like, you know, the whole thing. And then third year of medical school, I went to do my OBGYN rotation. It did not like it. (laughs) Yes. I had done all these years in my mind, but isn't that how life is? Like you think for years, you could be going on and on about something and then something happens and you're like, wait a minute, this is not in alignment. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Exactly. And that's what ended up happening is I got to my rotation, seeing the real life, how this works. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't like this. <laughs> the, the, the surgeries, the time, you know, the, the timing of it, where you had to be there five in the morning for your surgeries to begin. Right. And then after you were done, you had to go to the clinic and see mm-hmm. patients in the clinic. And then you had to be on call. And I mean, it was just like ongoing. Even mm-hmm. after you're done with residency, this doesn't stop. Okay. I know people do this and it's great work, but it's not for me. Right, right. <laughs> and so I went to the next rotation, which was emergency medicine. Mm-hmm. And I, I love that it's a little bit of surgical stuff you get to do. I like that you have to know a lot about many things because mm-hmm. anything can walk through the door. You have to be able to manage it. Yeah. And I like that it was shift work where you, you didn't even have a beeper. Mm-hmm. You just showed up for your shift. You did your work and you went home. Nobody called you to say, oh, this person has a fever. What should we do? Right. None of that. So mm-hmm. I liked that when I showed up, I was hundred percent present. I did my work. And when I leave, I'm gone. <laughs> right. You know, and somebody else is there to mm-hmm. handle what's happening at the moment. So that setup worked much better for me. And that's what made me decide to go into emergency medicine was it just fit more with who I am, my personality. So we basically stabilize the wounded and the ill. So that's what we do. And a lot of times it's not an emergency that people come for. (laughs) And sometimes people are just, I can't tell you how many older people come to the emergency department because they're lonely. Wow. And they just don't have anyone to talk to and they make up stuff sometimes and they'll come in there and you realize this Mm -hmm. person doesn't have anything really going on. Mm -hmm. They just want human contact. You really have to put on all of those different hats. um, Absolutely. To suit the need of the patient when they come in. Um, And it really, really helps people, even in you defining what an emergency medicine physician um, has to do in preparation for what a patient might uh, present with, you know, and really there is Mm -hmm. no preparation other than once they get there. So that's amazing. Yeah. One of the things that I, um, I, as I was kind of um, snooping through your website and things like that, I, I, you, you made mention of, of this and you said this, uh, I think at the very beginning of COVID. Um, and I can quite imagine, or maybe not, um, how physicians and nurses were feeling when COVID started. Um, being mm-hmm. in that emergency room setting, not quite yet knowing and understanding what we were dealing with um, overall. But something right. you said that was so, um, it was touching to me because I think, especially during this pandemic, because many of us have never lived through a pandemic. Um, but mm-hmm. this being so widely impacting people all over the world, you said this, you said, it's what we're called to do is what we choose to do. And I thought those words coming from a physician in the trenches at a time like this really um, is a reminder and should have been a reminder for many other physicians to really understand the full breadth of why they are now, you know, even more so providing this level of service under these conditions. Um, Absolutely. So can you just um, talk to you know, how you were feeling in that moment? Yeah, um, I, I don't know if that was the Good Morning America 
interview, there were a few interviews I did at the beginning mm -hmm. of the pandemic about what we were going through. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in addition to not knowing from patient to patient who had coronavirus and, you know, was I going to get it today? Mm -hmm. Right. Literally, we were going in every day like, you know, we saw how detrimental it could be to you know, a patient could come in. Literally, I had a patient within six hours. I saw her decompensate from she was a woman with asthma. So she already had a chronic lung problem. Right. I saw her literally come in and she was struggling. We gave her some treatment. Mm -hmm. But over a few hours, I literally saw her just go from being maybe six out of 10 in severity to 10 out of 10 in severity. I mean, it was wow. that fast within hours. Wow. And I was like, this thing is not something we should be playing around with. Like mm -hmm. I literally saw how quickly she went from being not okay and manageable to we're about to put this woman on a ventilator. Wow. So that was, you know, what we were seeing like the first few you know, weeks to months. Mm -hmm. And so that coupled with, I couldn't see my kids, you know, my ex-husband had them in Baltimore and we were worried that, you know, with me working so many shifts, you know, that they being in the house with me, they make, you know, if I got it, then they would have it, you know, so many of the ER doctors, many of the, you know, surgeons, a lot of people who had direct contact with the, with the public were staying away from their family. Mm -hmm. Either you were staying in a little back room, right. <laughs> coming right. in the house through the garage, like literally taking off everything and throwing it in a wash. Like it was a whole process when you got right. home of how to decontaminate mm -hmm. before getting in the house so that you're keeping your family safe. Right. So that was the thing we were going through. I mean, we're still obviously doing that now, not so much to that extent because we have a better understanding of what we're dealing with now. But in right. the beginning, it was like, look, we have to protect ourselves. We have to protect the patients. Mm -hmm. We have to protect our families. And we've trained for mass casualty. We've trained for, you know, being in a hazmat situation where, you know, something goes off and, you know, maybe there's some kind of a contamination in the air. Mm -hmm. You know what to do for those things because you've mm -hmm. trained for it. No one trained for coronavirus. None. <laughs> No, yeah. it wasn't even in the books, right? Okay. It just came mm -hmm. out of nowhere and we had to adjust. We had to literally improvise as mm -hmm. we went along, you know, everybody scrambling mm -hmm. and trying to figure out the best way to handle it. And, you know, by saying that this is what we choose to do and what we're called to do, mm -hmm. um, you get to choose every day when you're going to work, right? You get to choose how you're going to show up. Right. Are you going to show up and complain and have that negative energy, which is ultimately going to spill over to everyone you interact with? Exactly. Or are you going to go in and say, look, we don't know exactly what this is, mm -hmm. but what we do know is you can wash your hands. You can cover your, you know what I mean? You can right. put your mask on. You can social distance. We know these things from treating viruses in the past mm -hmm. that this will help. Right. And that was our message, really. We were just going in and just saying, look, just do your part. Be a responsible citizen. You know what I mean? Do your part yeah. so we can get out of this thing. <laughs> right, right. Right. And, right? and to minimize the damage. Right. And so that was basically what we did. And, and then there was a time where, you know, when it first came on, a lot of, um, you know, the other, you know, like some of the techs in the ER, mm -hmm. um, they were still walking around without a mask. Look, mm. I got two kids at home. I was not playing any games. The minute this thing came up, my mask was on from the moment I walked in there That's right. to the moment I left. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I don't know who's here, what they're here for. But every time I go in, I'm assuming you've got it, right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> until proving otherwise, because I mean, there's just no way to, to you can, that's almost like trying to figure out who has HIV just by looking right. at them. Yeah. You can't do that. You can't. You don't know who's got what. So you've got to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. And ultimately you're protecting your family. You're, protect, you're you know, you're protecting the patients mm -hmm. in the future because if you get sick, now your services are gone. Right. 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 Now you're right. out of commission. But in and you talking about employment. <laughs> you know what I mean? You right. know, 
you're either using up sick days or you're not getting paid, you know, is one or the other. Right. I people over. So there's so many, yeah, it's so many, you know, consequences to not being responsible, yeah. you know? And so when I made that comment, that's really where I was coming from is this is our responsibility to do our part so that we can sort of traverse through this thing, get to the end of it. I'm so glad this vaccine is here. <laughs> Please get those vaccines, guys. Please yeah. get the vaccines. Yeah. I'm fully vaccinated. I think two weeks ago, I got my second one. Okay. Um, I got the Moderna vaccine. Okay. Actually, one of my facilities had the Pfizer one and the other one had the Moderna. And I just happened to be doing a shift there okay. when they were you know, giving out the vaccine. So I went with that. Okay. Either one is great. The efficacy is great. Um, the side effects, you know, um, I, I'll tell you from my personal experience, I got some soreness in my arm. I took some Tylenol and that was it. That was the extent of it for me. The yeah. benefit of getting the vaccine so outweighs whatever side effect you may have for 24 hours. Right. Okay. Literally the side effects typically run 24 to 48 hours and it's gone. Gotcha. So if that's the only thing you didn't have to deal with and then you're immune. Right. I mean, come on. <laughs> That's the message right Why there. Are you even talking about these side effects? I don't understand. I'm like, look, you are immune. Can you see the, you know, I think you can you weigh the, the benefits? <laughs> yeah, they, they, they outweigh the benefits of actually getting COVID. As an emergency medicine physician sitting here, you know, I did the panel, you know, at my church a couple of weeks ago, a few of the doctors in the church, we did a panel. We all came on telling the congregation the same thing. Look, we are physicians. We're taking it. We've done the research. We've looked right. to make sure that we were at the table during the process of these, these vaccines coming out. Right. So we're represented in the making of it and the research of it. So uh, especially for the African-American community, we're doubtful and for good reason. Right. <laughs> so I'm not, you know, for valid reasons. But what I'm saying right now is that we do need to take that vaccine. Got it. That's our way out of this thing, the way I see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just glad that we have something that's effective and that's wow. going to give us that immunity we need to ultimately move out of this and go back to some form of normalcy again, right. you know, where we're able to socialize and gather and do things, you know, and, and be able to get back to some, you know, normal. sort of A normal, normal living. <laughs> This is a new normal. And I guess for you, because I, I believe you um, shared with me that you were traveling uh, throughout the United States. Yes. So I am a, I have an independent contracting emergency medicine business. Mm -hmm. And so uh, different hospitals hire me to come in mm -hmm. and it's, it's almost like, think of it like a substitute teacher. Wow. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's so you have your life. regular teachers, right? You have your regular <laughs> teachers. And then, you know, if they have a gap in the schedule right. where they still need to fill in, they bring in the consultants. And so that's what I do. I've been doing it since 2016. Wow. And so I travel to, I have seven licenses. Wow. And mostly on the East Coast, mm -hmm. um, from Maine down to Florida. And I've got a bunch of licenses. So I schedule my work. Mm -hmm. from month to month based on number one if I have my kids I work locally mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. two weeks out of the month that I don't have them mm -hmm. you know I can travel to other states right <laughs> and it's been fun it's been really fun to see other areas you know I've worked in Maine I've worked in Florida you know I've worked in Delaware you know I have uh, licenses in multiple places so when they book me they book me like two months three months in advance so I know that this is coming up you know, ahead of time. Okay. And so I was lucky enough um, that when the pandemic started, I had two contracts here in Maryland okay. that were independent contracts, but local. Mm -hmm. And so I did some traveling at the very beginning of it, but as it started to get, you know, and as I started to see that this was not going away yes, <laughs> anytime yes. soon, mm -hmm. I kind of, you know, basically started to focus on just doing the local jobs. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't be in a plane and, you know, flying from place to place as often. And so that's worked out great. So for the last, I would say probably 10, 10 months or so, mm -hmm. my work has pretty much been here in Maryland, even though they're still considered, you know, independent contract work is local. 
Right, right. And, and you know what? The patients yeah. haven't changed. <laughs> so you're still getting the same patient. Uh, Absolutely. No matter where you are. <laughs> yes. They have not changed. Yes. I just want to shift gears just, just a second. When I first met you, um, I just want to go back there for just a minute. You actually, this was my mm -hmm. first meetup that I had ever attended. Never knew anything about meetups, but I was invited with a friend to come to the meetup at uh, your favorite restaurant, I learned, <laughs> uh, in, in Columbia, Maryland, just to give them a little shout out. But um, we met there <laughs> and there were a group of people who I'd never met before, um, hadn't met you before, but um, the meetup was specifically uh, uh, from what I you know, gathered, just a wealth of information about healthy lifestyles, healthy yes. eating, um, and there were so many things shared uh, in that in that session, um, which brings me to the Dr. Die Fit Life dot com <laughs> because yes. you are a this is what i i've titled you as affectionately you are passion in action you are passion <laughs> in action um, i like it <laughs> yeah i think you need to carry that i'm passion in action um because <laughs> of the information that you shared then and you've continued to share as it pertains to our health, our overall health. You can look at health from a clinical perspective. Um, you definitely um, look at health from a fitness perspective. Um, yes. Nutrition, uh, very vital. And I definitely wanna, wanna chat about that a bit. Um, but what was your motivating uh, drive to even get into the fitness space? Were you always very athletic? or was there an occurrence or something like that? Or did you just love, you know, being fit, looking fit, looking healthy? Um, what was it that kind of drove you um, into that arena? Oh, I love the question. So I like talking about what brought it on because sometimes people just assume this is just who you've been right. your whole life, you know, and it's not. <laughs> so let's start with that. Um, so I actually started my fitness journey back in 2012. Wow. So before 2012, you know, I would go to the gym like everybody else, you know, I would go once in a while. Um, and I would be like, Oh, I did that check, you know, <laughs> and move on. But it wasn't a commitment for sure. It wasn't something that I thought about weekly as something that was part of my self-care mm -hmm. as something I really needed to, you know, be intentional about. Yeah. It was just, I had this membership. I would go when I felt like it. Most people kind of, that's where most people are typically mm -hmm. is you just go whenever you feel like going. Right. And that's where I was. So, um, before that I had lost my dad, mm. my dad had, um, diabetes and he got basically, um, on the kidney transplant list wow. uh, because he was on dialysis. You know, one of the complications mm -hmm. of diabetes that most people are aware of, mm -hmm. your kidneys um, stop functioning. Mm -hmm. And so for my dad, he was on dialysis for many years and he wanted to go back home to Liberia. Mm -hmm. But Liberia didn't have a dialysis system set up. Wow. And he really wanted to go back home. Um, he had done really well in business there. Um, and I think he just felt you know, his position in the community there was something that was, you know, just more in line with what he wanted for his life yeah. than oh. he was doing here. Mm -hmm. So he was really mm -hmm. pushing to get back home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of, you know, a lot of, um, of, of people who grew up in, in West Africa, at least from my experience, who mm -hmm. had a really good life there, a lot of them want to go back. Right. Right. Because it's different when you go to a different country and you don't have the same opportunities. Exactly. And so he really wanted to go back. And so he got on this transplant list to get the transplant so that he wouldn't need dialysis. Mm -hmm. But the transplant didn't work for him. Wow. Right. He ended up um, having a massive intestinal bleed and um, he actually had a cardiac arrest. Mm. This was a couple of years before my fitness journey. And so I saw him go through that whole experience. Process. And that was really the initial piece that for me, I was like, okay, my dad got diabetes as an adult, right? Which is totally preventable. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. right? This is a preventable condition that so many of us in the African-American community are suffering with. Wow. That's totally preventable. And Dr. Lake, I just want to stop you just for a second there, because something else you said that is so profound and so significant, people need to hear this. You said this, you said things don't have to run through your family. Yes. Yes. It really doesn't, mm. right? Because a lot of us will put our hands up and just be like, oh, well, high blood pressure runs in our family right. or diabetes runs in our family. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to. Yeah. These are things we as adults can do something about, right? right? Even the blood pressure by itself. Mm -hmm. The studies shown that just losing 10% of your body weight can mm -hmm. drastically reduce your blood pressure to the point that you may not even need to be on the, the medication. Mm -hmm. So these are things we can do ourselves mm -hmm. to make the change that we want to see, right? We have all these ideas of how we want to feel, how we want to look, how we, you know, we want our lives to go when it comes right. to our health, mm -hmm. but we need to do the steps, right? It's not going to magically happen. We have to right. take those steps. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so when I saw my dad going through that, that was the first time it really registered to me. I need to take better care of my health. Because if this happened to him, that this is a risk factor for me, right? Right. Automatically, that makes diabetes a risk factor for me mm -hmm. because I have a parent who right. developed it. So that's the other thing, knowing your risk factors, mm -hmm. right? Knowing what, what's been in the family, what other people close to you, your, your, your sister, your brother, your parent, right? What kind of, the, your aunt, your uncle, what kind of things have they had? Mm -hmm. Right. So if there's a family history of it, that's a risk factor for you. Right. So that you that automatically should make you be like, uh oh, yeah. let me check this for myself. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was my first point of, you know, I need to make a change. Right. Was with my dad. Mm -hmm. Then the second one was I went through a divorce in 2012. Mm -hmm. And I was just emotionally drained by that process. I was just like, oh my God. I mean, I was at a point where one day, one of my girlfriends, I was talking to her and just telling her just how emotionally wiped out I was. And she recommended that we go for a run. And I was like, girl, I don't run. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> she didn't say walk either. Run. She said, run. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, okay, let's just go. We will do a little run and a walk and a run and a walk, you know, trying to, to make it feasible. <laughs> I was like, okay. We went out and I remember this was June, 2012. I swear I remember this Jacqueline because it changed my life. Wow. I went out with her just feeling, you know, down and just in a low place emotionally yeah. and after we went for that movement of just walking and running in the neighborhood on a beautiful june day yes i got home and i felt so good yes oh my god i was like wow that awesome. is incredible that all you've got to do is move your body to that's completely it. change your mood that's it i was like when are, you, when are we going again <laughs> Just looking at me like, oh, <laughs> yes, I was, I just felt so great. And I just wanted that again. That's like, I just friend. wanted, yes, yeah. I just wanted to get that feeling again of yeah. just feeling so, you know, energized and just, you know, not that the things that were going on with the separation and the divorce went away, right. but now I had a way to cope. Yes. You know what I mean? Now I had a way to get that extra angst and stress mm -hmm. dealt with right and that was it for me and once you I started I started running yes yes go ahead no, you said something you said reframe you, you mentioned about reframing your mindset yes but you were talking about food and uh, emotional eating and losing weight but that's like the very beginning of it I yes to reframe my mindset Absolutely. Absolutely. Then the reason I say that is when you go into fitness mm -hmm. with the idea that it's difficult, right. with the idea that it's exhausting and, oh, I don't have the time. And mm -hmm. because a lot of people will go into it with the negative, right? Mm -hmm. What is it that's not working? They'll focus on what's not working. 
So the reframing and the, the, the shifting of the mindset piece is, what if it does work? Yeah. Right. What would be the benefit of, 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 of doing it? Right. Mm -hmm. How could this make things better for you? Mm -hmm. Right. If you do it and it works for you, what does that do for your life? Yes. How does it change your life? Mm -hmm. Right. So if you start looking at it from that perspective of, look, this could improve my circulation. Yeah. This could improve my glucose. This could improve my blood pressure. Mm -hmm. This could make me get off of these meds. Yeah. Right. <laughs> this could make me get off of these medications. I have one of my clients right now. Um, she's on insulin. She's mm -hmm. a, a type one diabetic. Okay. And over the last, what is it? Nine weeks, she's mm -hmm. lost 18 pounds. Wow. She went and got her hemoglobin A1C checked at her endocrinologist because they check it every three months right. to see how well controlled the glucose is. Mm -hmm. Her number went down almost 2%. Wow. Just by the weight reduction, better mm -hmm. eating, right. and all of the things that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And so they brought her dose down right. of mm -hmm. how much insulin she now needs to take. Mm. that's how you get off the medication is right. you do the things that are, you know, that you need to do to lose the weight, mm -hmm. to improve your eating. Mm -hmm. And then you see that your, your need for the medication reduces and ultimately you come off. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you go from one day being on, you know, 20 units of insulin to just being off. Right. right. It's sort right. of a taper right. mm -hmm. as your body adjusts mm -hmm. and you start to do more of the physical activity and you're eating less sugary stuff and you're eating less carbs and you know you're eating a healthier meal plan mm -hmm. your stress is better managed mm -hmm. because it's a holistic thing right right it's not just eat this mm -hmm. and do this workout it's sleep better yeah. hydrate reduce your stress mm -hmm. the thing that's making you eat the wrong things in the first place right, <laughs> right right get to the crux of the issue like get to the, the, the bottom of it right right mm -hmm. all of that requires you to think differently about your health mm. that's so true. you know you have to come from that place of how do i do this holistically so all of my life mm -hmm. is is you know aligned with what i want my health and wellness to be right it can't be I'm drinking alcohol every day over here, but I'm doing a workout two hours a day. Like, you know, that it, it doesn't work. Yeah, that's a little off, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the eating, the sleeping, the stress management, the movement, yeah. the, you know, what are you doing for social engagement? What are you doing for self-care? Yeah. What are you doing for your spiritual well-being, yeah. right? Your mental well-being, like all of that mm -hmm. is important. Because that's what keeps you in alignment right. with meeting your goals. Yeah, it, it can be works. like, oh, yeah. I'm in this one space compartmentalizing mm -hmm. my fitness, but then everything else is in chaos. Right, <laughs> right, right. That's called imbalance. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so yes. So definitely having that mindset that okay, I'm gonna go into this and look strictly for. What's in it for me? Could be selfish about it if you have right, to. <laughs> right. What's in it for me? What am I going to get out of this? Yes. You and know. Then it, once you focus on that, uh -huh. it makes it easier to, to to stick with it because you're focusing on the benefits and uh -huh. not what could could go wrong. Yeah. I, I don't know um, whether this was a direct quote from you, but you posted it on your site, and you said, "Allow you're allowed to be a masterpiece." and a work in progress. Yes! <laughs> I don't know where you got that from, but I tell you, I had to sit there and say, now, wait a minute, that one I'm going to repeat. <laughs> I <laughs> think I got it off of Pinterest. <laughs> yeah, listen, it was beautiful because it's true. Sometimes you're excelling in one area, you know, and you're doing great there. But there's, there's still yet a work in progress. You still yes. want to improve. And there's nothing wrong with being both at the same time. Absolutely. Um, you know, being okay with, okay, I'm excelling in this and be confident in that thing. I mean, you're a doctor. You didn't just stop at being a doctor. You said, I'm going to be a doctor. I need to get my fitness, in, you know, uh, together. Um, yes. And, and we're going to talk about eating too, because I yes. am floored uh, and what, really for um, anyone watching uh, this conversation, the things that you incorporated, um, even as it related, to, or as it relates to food, 
and what you did, not just for yourself, but for your family. And yes. those, I don't know whether those were like major changes or maybe you always ate fairly healthy, but had to kick it into another year as a result mm -hmm. of what you're dealing in your family. Um, talk to us a little bit about that, because I think those are also those other pieces that come together when you talk about the holo ho holistic approach um, yes. to changing your lifestyle. Yes, no, the, the, that's a good point. Um, but to go back to the, the quote, mm -hmm. a lot of us, you know, don't uh, appreciate the things that we've already accomplished. Where mm -hmm. A lot of us focus on the things that we haven't accomplished. Mm -hmm. You know, we're like, oh, I haven't done this yet. Uh, oh, I still have this to do. Uh, oh, I still have this much weight to lose. Or, mm -hmm. you know, we focus on the thing that hasn't happened yet. Right. right. And that's not a good place to start because it, it almost makes you feel like you haven't done much. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you look back, right, at all of the things that have brought you here. Right. Right. That's you had stepping stones. Right. You had things that you've done and you've checked mm -hmm. off to get you here. Right. Yes, there's still room to grow. There's always going to be room to grow. Believe it or right? not. <laughs> Yes, I don't care who you look at, whether it's, you know, <laughs> President Obama, yeah. right? I'm sure he's got areas that he's still working on, yeah. right? You can think about anyone that you admire, anyone yeah. that you hold high in respect and admiration, mm -hmm. trust and believe. They got their own thing they're working on. Look, behind so, every door, there's a story. <laughs> yes. And so that's what I love about that quote is that, yes, there are things you're still working on, yeah. but there's some other things you are a complete master at, yes. right? That other people wish they had, yes. right? Whether it's your organizational skills, whether it's your ability to be you know, uh, empathetic, right? Some people don't even see that as a gift, like your ability to be supportive, whatever that is that you're really good at, own it, right. claim it Right. in the process right. of being better at this other thing that you're working on. Yes. Right? Yeah. So you're both simultaneously mm -hmm. and that is okay. Right. So that's, I just love it. I love yeah. it because when women come to me and they want to work on their fitness, mm -hmm. they are typically down about it. Yes, you know, right. and I'm like, okay, well, let's look at your wins today. Let's start right. with the wins. Right. Right. <laughs> let's it, start it, with the things that are it, working. Yes. And guilty <laughs> is charged. Guilty is charged. We always <laughs> feel like it's pride um, if we feel positive about something. Um, and yes. that's not what it is. It's confidence. You know, I can be mm -hmm. confident in this thing while I'm still working on trying to be something else. You said something else, Absolutely. I'm gonna go back to this food, but you said something, uh, this is another quote that you posted. These are good quotes, I mean, for anybody, they need to check out your website, <laughs> your Facebook post. You said, never measure your progress using someone else's ruler. I thought, no. okay, because that's true. Right. Because you don't know how long they've been working at that. Exactly, exactly. And because they may look finished and accomplished, um, you don't take the time to think, well, they had to work at that to get there. They didn't just wake yes. up wonderful. They had to right. work. I looked at your physique um, on your, your, your Facebook uh, um, page and I'm thoroughly jealous. Um, just to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, how did she do it? And then you, you posted a very, very, very transparent um, picture. Oh, the one with my belly. <laughs> and, and listen, I'm going to be straight honest with you. When I saw the picture, I said, oh, she must be posting like her pre-pregnancy picture. You know, I, I, I was like, you know, just all, I said, wow, she did there from there. And then you so boldly said, I'm not pregnant. <laughs> and I thought, wow, then tell me how you did that because I and I I will tell you what happened to me when I saw it and I started reading my whole posture changed I'm sitting in the kitchen I started sitting up straight I sucked in my stomach <laughs> it's like I know there's hope for me there's hope for me right now <laughs> but, but that people, is too people, funny <laughs> people, people people look at one thing you know we have a skewed vision People can be looking at the same thing with two separately different perspectives. Two absolutely different perspectives. And I was so glad that you so boldly just said, okay, this was me a couple of weeks ago. And this <laughs> is me now. 
Now, everybody may not be, I may not be able to get my stomach back like yours did so quickly and so beautifully, but you let me know that it was possible. Yes. And, and I think that's what people need to see when they see a finished product. See what's possible. Yes. <laughs> Instead Absolutely. Of what you see what's do. possible and yeah. see what is required, right? The yeah. steps. Because yeah. I think a lot of us want to skip the steps and just jump to the final yeah. <laughs> and just jump to the final thing, right? You <laughs> all want that end product, yes. but you've got to see what those steps, those intermediate steps are. Right. What do you need to, you know, do less of? What do you need to do more of? What do you need to add? What do you need to take away? Right. So that you get that finished product that you want. Um, okay. And that was really the the point of that post was mm -hmm. I was having all those drinks and birthday cake <laughs> and <laughs> I was enjoying myself and my belly was not happy. <laughs> having a good old time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and my belly was like, oh, this is how we're doing it now. <laughs> Out of control, out of control. But the beautiful thing is, and, and you showed, there were so many messages in that moment. Just watching that piece, there were so many messages. Just looking at the pictures, the message said progress can be made. Yes. You know, if people just stop right there and not always um, uh, uh, turn to the negative aspect of something. And really, like you said, look at the wins you know, yes. and then continue to yes. ask God for a win. God, I need a win. That's a quote from my neighbor. God, I need a win. <laughs> you know, <laughs> ever since she said that, when I see things and I start getting kind of, you know, feeling kind of funny, I ask, mm -hmm. I say, God, I need a win. <laughs> yes. You know, and it level sets back to that reframing of the mind. Absolutely. That's and when you, and that's the funny thing, what you focus on mm -hmm. is what ends up growing in your life. So yes. if you're focusing on the wins, you will start to see more wins, right? Exactly. You'll start to see more wins because that's what you're focusing on. That's what mm -hmm. will grow, mm -hmm. right? So the th if you're festering in negativity, then more of that is going to show up. <laughs> And that becomes who you are. Yes. And, and, and that's, that's just your experience of life. Exactly. You exactly. know, so looking for the possibilities and saying, all right, I, I, I you know, did this birthday thing a little too much. <laughs> I had a little too many, many sweets and cakes and now my belly is bloated. Yeah. Like I'm six months pregnant. How do I turn this around? Yeah. Right. That was me. I was like, okay, how do I turn this around? Because this is not cute. <laughs> well, I would say it's definitely not cute on me. <laughs> and, and, and coming to that realization, mm -hmm. and, and that's another point, yeah. owning it, yeah. right? Owning that you're part of this thing that's happening yeah. to, to you, right? right? This wasn't Somebody else didn't experience. put the food in your mouth. You ate that food. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no one else you know, said, you must eat this. You decided to do that, right? Yes. So now you have to take ownership. Mm -hmm. We don't like that, right? A lot of us are not comfortable taking ownership that we are, you know, part of why this is happening to us, right? Mm -hmm. And so taking ownership and saying, you know what? I need to adjust my nutrition. And we, you know, you wanted to talk about nutrition so we can talk about it here. Mm -hmm. Making that, you know, decision and all of what we do, all of what we do starts with a decision, right? Right. It starts with a thought in our heads that says, this needs to stop. Right. Whatever it is, you know, whether it's a drinking problem, whether it's a smoking problem, whether it's overeating or emotional right. eating or addiction to sugar mm -hmm. or salt or alcohol, like whatever, right? Whatever it is that about our lifestyle that we want to adjust, mm -hmm. it first needs to start with our decision to want to end it. Right. right. You have to come to that, you know, determination that, okay, this has to stop. Mm -hmm. This has been going on. I'm done with it. Like I see what it's done to my life. I see what it's done to my emotions. I see what it's done to my confidence. Mm -hmm. I need to do something differently. Right. right. Once you make that decision and you are firm in it, mm -hmm. the next thing you want to do is what's happening right now while this is in this current condition, Right. How am I feeling? Do I feel good about it? Right. You know, what are the negative impacts of me remaining this way? Mm -hmm. Right. It's probably going to get worse. Or if it doesn't get worse, if it stays the same, how is it negatively impacting my life? So you really want to kind of 
do this introspection, you know, like with yourself Mm -hmm. and be honest and say, this is not working for me. And these are the reasons why. Once you're clear on that, Mm -hmm. there's no going back, right? Because you've come to that determination that, okay, this no longer serves me, Mm. right? So now the next step is going into action, right? That's where a lot of us fall short is we think about it. We, you know, they say knowing and doing are two very different things. things. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. You can, right? know, you can know something. That doesn't mean you're going to do it. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. So you can get into the knowing that is, is not what you want for your life. It's right. not what you desire to be. But now you got to switch from knowing to doing. Right. Right. So the action steps have to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get the nutrition education piece uh, to come in because we spend a lot of our days eating, right? That's that's a part of just what we do. So if you get that eating part right, Mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I feel like that's 70% of of your win right there. If you get the eating part right, then you can add the movement, Mm -hmm. right? And make sure you're doing at least 30 minutes of moderately intense movement. Mm -hmm. And I say movement and not exercise because that movement could be many things. Right. It could be a hike. Mm -hmm. It could be a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. It could be dancing to soca music. Yes. (laughs) For 30 minutes. It could be many things. It could be jumping on a treadmill. Just move. Right. You get to decide that what you want that movement to be. Mm-hmm. you get it you get to decide something you enjoy something that brings you happiness right right you don't want to work out and feel like crappy while you're doing it and, and I, <laughs> I would get you to say that that's probably the issue with most people they think about exercise as work yes you like, want it to be fun you want it to be yeah. something you enjoy exactly so that when you're done doing it you're like wow that was great I feel good and then I you want to, want to set up a night again, like you said with your friend oh I want to go run again <laughs> Yes. You want it to be something that you feel like you want to do again. Like I'm a tennis player. I love playing tennis. That's a great cardio, you know, activity. Mm -hmm. So it could be something like that. Right. Maybe you used to play play basketball with your friends in college and you stopped. Hook up with them. Yeah. Right. Or something like that. Mm -hmm. So something that you know is going to bring you joy, that is an activity Mm -hmm. and, you know, you can do it time and time again and you won't get sick of it. Right. That's really the way to do it so that it's long-term, you know, you can stick with it long-term. Mm-hmm. It's got to yeah. be something you enjoy. Yeah. What are some of your nutritional uh, or, or regimens, you know, as a person? Okay. So for the nutrition piece, mm-hmm. um, it depends on the person, right? So I'll just give people the backstory for me. Mm-hmm. What really made me get into nutrition was my younger son, right? So my younger son was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder right before he turned three. Right. So he's 10 now. He's mm-hmm. what, uh, 10 and a half, well, almost 10 and a half now. Mm-hmm. Um, so this was like a little over seven years ago. Mm-hmm. And once we found out what was going on with him and we got the diagnosis, we went through all the testing and all of that. Mm-hmm. I did some research on how can I support this child, right? right? What is the best thing we can do to make sure that he becomes the best version of himself, to give him all of the opportunities to just, you know, develop into whatever it is he's going to be, right? right? Because we really didn't know. Mm -hmm. At the the time, he was barely talking, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I read that, you know, really removing a lot of the toxins out of our food helps Mm -hmm. children with neurologic conditions. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, well, if we're going to do it for him, we're going to do it for the whole household. Right. So we basically went from, and not that our food was terrible, Mm -hmm. but I will say we were doing way more McDonald's and, you know, processed foods and things Mm -hmm. like that off and on Mm -hmm. than we're doing now, Mm -hmm. you know, so it just became more of an intentional way of eating. Yeah. right? We're mm-hmm. not going to do that. We're going to do this, you know, choosing, you know, what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. So basically the packaged foods, the processed foods, the, the quick, you know, pancakes already made and you just right. heat it up. We had to kind of get rid of a lot of those, mm-hmm. right? Um, I started doing gluten-free stuff for him, but also just making sure most of what we were doing, a majority, I would say 80 to 90% of what we're doing is organic, 
you know, so our fruits, our produce, you know, the spinach, you know, whatever it is I'm making my veggie omelet with, right. you know, the eggs, making sure they're, you know, veggie fed uh, mm -hmm. chicken, you know, that we're getting the eggs from. If we're doing beef, make sure it's grass fed beef, you know, like all that kind right. of stuff. Mm -hmm. If we're doing fish, make sure we're getting wild caught okay. fish, mm -hmm. fish that's caught in the wild mm -hmm. and not farmed. Right? right. So we basically switched everything to as non-GMO as possible, where we were just getting something as, as close to the source, right. right? Without all the additional antibiotics and the additional pesticides and the right. additional steroids and all, all the things that they add into our foods, right? right? Especially with the fish mm -hmm. and the dairy, you know, they, they add so much to the food right. because they want those animals mm -hmm. to survive in these toxic environments that right. they're raising them in, right? So they pre-treat them with antibiotics so they don't get sick. They give them steroids so they grow faster mm -hmm. and all that stuff. And then we eat it. <laughs> and all that stuff is in the flesh, in the meat right. of the yeah. food. So once I started doing the research, I was like, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you right. know, that we're eating this way. And we wonder why our daughters are menstruating at night. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, things, and, you never had yes. it fine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, we wonder why, you know, the kids are just growing like wild, right. you know. <laughs> Right. And I mean, all of this stuff we're feeding ourselves and our mm -hmm. children mm -hmm. is full of additives and all kinds of stuff. So we really went to as basic as possible in our food, Got it. whole foods, you know, um, and then when you really want to get granular about it, looking at how many grams of carbs per day, mm -hmm. how many grams of fat per day, how many grams of protein per day. Mm -hmm. And now I don't have to look at the grams of each thing because I've been doing it long enough. I kind of have a general gestalt of what I should eat for each meal. Mm -hmm. But in general, the American population eats about 300 grams of carbs per day wow. in a 2000 calorie meal plan. Mm -hmm. Right. So for me, typically, I don't do 2000 calories per day. Mm -hmm. I'm eating somewhere around 15 to 1600 calories per day. Okay. All right. So that's sufficient for me. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we hit this 2000 because, you know, you, you see it written all over the place. This is based on a 2000 calorie diet. You don't need it. Right. You know, you don't have to eat 2000 calories per day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're eating 2000 calories per day, you better be burning more than 2000 right. calories per day. Right. <laughs> right? Be really because bitter. the way you lose. Yes. Because the way you lose weight mm -hmm. is by expending more energy. Mm -hmm. then you're taking in right weight loss is math mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay you want to be in a calorie deficit meaning your body uses a certain amount of calories to function every day right for one person it may be 1200 calories that your body is burning up mm -hmm. just functioning normally without you doing any exercise right. just what it takes for your body to run mm -hmm. so what we're asking is that you want to you know to add to what your body's doing normally Right. right. Your body may be burning 1300, 1400 calories to function. Mm -hmm. But if you're eating 2000 calories and your body's only burning 1400, you see that what I'm saying? Yeah. Every single day, there's another 600 calories that's just adding on. Right. Where and do you that, think that, that goes? goes into what? Fat? Your waistline. <laughs> <laughs> you're growing. Yes. <laughs> yes. So if you're not burning that off, Right. right. And especially if those calories are coming from processed foods and simple right. sugars mm. and things like that, if you're not burning it off, it's going to go to belly fat. Right. Right. It's going to go on your body and just sit there. Mm. So every day that you're eating and you're eating more than you're burning off. Right. That extra amount of calories just sits on you. Mm. Right. So it's math. Yeah. Right. So when you work out, when you mm -hmm. exercise, you're adding to the amount of calories your body's burning. Right. The baseline mm -hmm. plus the extra. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you see what I'm saying? Right. So when you're right. doing that 30 minutes or 40 minutes of activity, you're burning more than what your baseline, you know, metabolic rate is. Okay. You're basically, it's kind of like extra credit. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you're, you're doing more to balance things out, right? Right. 
so that whatever extra stuff you've had to eat, mm -hmm. you're doing, you're burning that off now, mm -hmm. right? Because your body has this basal metabolic rate that it works at just to function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, th those number of calories, you're not really, you're not really burning off what you're eating with that. That's just to, to just exist. Right, <laughs> right, right. right? right? So that's what I'm saying. If you can manage to move that calorie intake down to 15 or 1600 right. and still eat enough food, because if you're doing your veggies, mm -hmm. right, 50% of your plate, if you've got 50% of your plate with veggies and some fruit on there, mm -hmm. and then the other 50% is what you're working with for your protein and your carbs, mm -hmm. that's good, right? Because the veggies are pretty low calorie. Right. You can have literally half of your plate be veggies and it's like 20 calories. 30 calories, yeah. literally mm -hmm. veggies are very low calorie, mm -hmm. but they fill you up. Right. And right. they're good because they have a ton of vitamins and nutrients in them. Mm -hmm. All those vitamins will reduce inflammation in your body. Right. So on so many levels, you're doing good for your body by just eating well. Mm -hmm. Good food. Yes. Good food. And then all those veggies will sweep out your colon every day. Yeah. So that you don't need to go do a cleanse. There's your cleanse. Right. Eat your veggies. <laughs> no. and, and I'm glad you said that too, because, you know, I, I mean, and maybe some people do need um, detoxing, um, but it's very rare that you hear someone say you can do it with food. Absolutely. You if you're right eating food. and hydrating well, yeah. right? If you're hydrating well, your body will move and eliminate every day. Okay. As long as you're having enough roughish in your meal plan. So 50% veggies, I, I really push that because if you're having that much veggies on your plate, it'll be enough to sweep out, literally sweep out your colon because the cellulose in the vegetables doesn't get digested. Mm -hmm. It literally serves like a broom going through your intestines and cleaning out yeah. as the stool comes out. It literally gets into all the little crevices and just right. sweeps things out. So mm -hmm. your veggies is where it's at. You want to do your veggies, lots of it, right. okay? As much as you can of the vegetables to help clean out your colon. And then the hydration is the second piece because over 65% of the American population is chronically dehydrated. Right. We don't drink enough fluids. And so what happens is when you don't drink enough fluids, your body pulls water out of your colon. It's the first place it goes. It's trying to conserve. Right. So it pulls water out of your colon and so the stool gets dry. Right. If the stool is dry, it's not going to come out. Mm -hmm. So then you're constipated. Right. And bloated. You got another problem. And belly's out to here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what's so funny? So simply drinking water. Yes. Simply yes. drinking water. And it doesn't even have to be just water. You could add some fruit in there, you know, infuse it, give it some flavor, right. you know, add some lemon or, you know, add something to give it some, it doesn't, have, or you could do green tea. Right. Green tea is an excellent, excellent anti-inflammatory drink mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right you can add some stevia in there i don't do sugar so right. i put stevia or monk fruit mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. you can add that in there drink that it'll help your liver burn more fat right green tea is a natural fat burner right right so not only does it have a bunch of anti-inflammatory properties, but it helps your liver burn fat. Who doesn't want that? <laughs> right, 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 right. So it's just, that's what I mean is you can literally create a, a meal plan mm -hmm. that is working to do the things you want to do. Right. Right. So it's working in your favor. Mm -hmm. And then when you do the exercises and you do the movements, that burns more calories. And so naturally you're just living you're not doing something, you know, miraculous. Right. You're just living with this holistic plan mm -hmm. and the fat is coming off, the weight is coming off, you're eating well. And then let's not forget about sleep, Ugh. right? Then once you start sleeping properly, mm. that's where your muscles tone and sculpt when you sleep. Mm. You see what I'm saying? So when you hydrate and you get the water in you, you allow your body to eliminate toxins, mm -hmm. right? You pee it out and you, it comes out in your stool. So naturally you're removing toxins from your body, mm -hmm. right? And you're clearing out your colon, right? And not only are you supporting your joints when you hydrate, as we age, especially as women, yes. you know, osteoporosis and all those things start to come into place. Yes. You want to make sure your joints 
Mm -hmm. You know, when you hydrate, your joints move better, right? Because it's fluid in your joints. It's called synovial fluid, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? The better hydrated you are, the more synovial fluid you have in those joints. So you don't have all that creaking going on. <laughs> You need that quick thing when I walk down the steps. <laughs> you know, so it's simple things, really simple things you can do that go so far. Right. You know what I mean? But because we don't know, mm. no, if no one ever told you, look, just hydrating will improve your 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 bowel movements, will improve right. the bloating. So your stomach doesn't feel so so big with all that, you know, like Stuff. constipation, right? Mm -hmm. And it also allows you to not crave as much sugar, right? Right. When you're properly hydrated, you don't go for the sugar and the salt as much. Right. So the benefits are just like, and you know, stacking up from simple behavioral changes. Yeah. Simple. You know, we can walk absolutely as masterpieces whole um, if we're willing to make the necessary changes and follow the recommendations exactly. and guidance of people who are in the business. Um, and not only that, you uh, are an example of the information that you're sharing. You're not just sharing information and sitting back waiting to see what happens. Um, but <laughs> you're a, No, honestly and truly, you're a living example of what you do as a byproduct of real work. You know, yes. and, and it's not necessarily hard work. It's just being willing to make the changes that will improve. And it feels good. Yeah, it really does. It yes. feels good. I feel great in my body. I'm 46 years old. Wow. I feel healthier now than before I had kids. I mean, it's wow. crazy, mm. right? Because then, you know, you're kind of like, oh, well, especially in my 30s, yeah. health was not like at the forefront of my mind right it was like you know I'll get to it you know mm -hmm. I'll do you know I'll go to the gym mm -hmm. yes I know <laughs> right you know but now I have to be very intentional about everything because I am at that stage of life where perimenopausal so many things are happening and so many things in your body yeah. are changing yeah you know your production of estrogen your production of cortisol not cortisol um collagen mm -hmm. your projection your production of all these things that actually make you feel youthful are declining yeah so you have to do things to continue to feel youthful to mm -hmm. continue to feel vibrant and alive and a lot of it comes from what you're eating mm -hmm. how much you're sleeping Right. how much you're managing your stress, mm -hmm. how well you're managing your stress, mm -hmm. you know, how much you're moving, you know, all these basic things. And if you're doing those things, you get to enjoy your life and not feel so drained, mm -hmm. exhausted, overwhelmed, mm -hmm. can't even go out and play with your kids for five minutes. You're, you're you know, exhausted. huffing and puffing. <laughs> White right. <out. laughs> you yeah. know, White like, out. yes. Yes, yes. Yes. And it, that's not how we're supposed to live. Right. That's not how we're supposed to feel. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's really about how does this make you feel? Mm -hmm. And if, if it's not what you're looking for, then it's time to make that adjustment so that you are feeling how you want to feel mm -hmm. and you're actually meeting those health and fitness goals. Right. That's why, that's why you are the author of a best-selling uh, <laughs> book called The Making of a Medical Mogul. <laughs> <laughs> yes you so that, that was a, a <laughs> yes that was a joint venture with 36 other physicians wow. um business people so we're all physicians who wrote that book uh -huh. but we all have little businesses as well <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and that's another thing you think um but that's another thing um that i think people should really you know kind of get comfortable with is not just doing one thing Right. You know, when I started my fitness companies, you know, back in 2016, mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how many people were like, why are you doing this? You're mm -hmm. already a doctor. Right. Why do you need to be, you know, coaching people about weight loss? Mm -hmm. Why not? Right. <laughs> Who died and said I had to just be a doctor? Right. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I started working with menopausal women. Mm -hmm. And helping them with, you know, relieving their menopausal symptoms. Same thing. Mm -hmm. People are like, why are you doing this thing? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, because there is a need, because right. I know that I can help people with this, because I'm, I'm really good at 
motivating people and teaching in a very simple way yeah. where people can get it, mm-hmm. you know, and it resonates and they see, ah, this is, you know, like, it's this working. is what I need to be yeah. doing. I know I'm good at it, you know, and that's the other thing. We need to know what we're good at right? <laughs> <laughs> and be willing to share. Um, yes. Be willing to share. Um, I, I, I have titled you perfectly. You are passive <laughs> in action. <laughs> So if anybody asked you, <laughs> I mean, honestly and truly, um, you, you, you've you not lived on an island where you said, I'm just going to gather all this for myself um, and not share it. I mean, yeah. what is it there for? What is the gain for? Um, if it's just going exactly. to satisfy me when I have within me the ability to impact the lives positively yes. of millions yes. of people. Um, and it's yes. not a selfish, you know, game. Um, it is really, really seeing lives changed. Um, Absolutely. I think you have done that amazingly, amazingly well. I want people, whoever is viewing, to kind of know how they can get in contact with you um, uh, just to learn more about what you're doing, your fitness program. Um, I know that you you have another little venture on there. Um, you posted, uh, information about supplements and how important supplements can be to your, your everyday, um, regimen. So how can people, um, get more information about, about you? Okay. So people can follow me, um, The main place that I'm putting information on a weekly basis um, is my Facebook page. So if you went to Facebook and you typed in Dr. Die Fitness, so my original page was Dr. Die Fit Life. There's a lot of information on there, D-R-D-I-F-I-T-L-I-F-E, but we're rebranding and we're moving over to a new page. um, And that page is Dr. Die Fitness, which is D-R-D-I and then the word fitness. So if you go there, uh, you will see I'm moving some of the content over there now. So Dr. Okay. Die Fitness, you can go to or Dr. Die Fit Life. Mm-hmm. Um, you can make an appointment if you have uh, interest in wanting to work with me. Mm-hmm. There are, you know, on there, you'll see a way to make um, an appointment for a free consultation, whether it's for menopause wellness okay. or it's for, you know, health and fitness. So both okay. of those are there. Mm -hmm. Um, I also have a free fitness accountability group for women Mm -hmm. and it is called fit boss culture club. I like it with Dr. Die is Mm -hmm. also on Facebook. Actually, if you go to the, the, the main fitness page, the fitness group is under there. It is a group run by this page. So you can connect to the fitness accountability group off of the Dr. Die fitness page. You'll see it there. It's, It's they're linked you know, you'll be able to see it. Um, But I am on Twitter. I I don't do Twitter much. I do Instagram. I am Dr. Die Fit Life on Instagram, D-R-D-I-F-I-T-L-I-F-E. So if people on Instagram, they'll see some of my posts there. But um, I would say Facebook. Facebook is the main way to um, see what I'm doing currently. Got it. And then, like, as I said, you know, um, if anyone is interested in working together, I do a 12-week coaching, I do a 12-week uh, fitness coaching program, and we're actually in week number 10 right now with the current group of ladies that I'm working with. So I'm actually enrolling people into the next uh, round, and it's ongoing, it's all year long. So uh, people can join at any time, and, you know, they just basically join in when they are ready. Um, So I have that. And for the menopause wellness, um, again, that's ongoing as well. I meet people wherever they are. And um, I have seven licenses, as I mentioned at the top of our talk. Mm -hmm. So I I treat women in those seven states. Okay. So if you're in Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, Delaware, Connecticut, Florida, and Maine, Okay. Those are the seven states that I have medical licenses, and those are the seven states that I can prescribe the the treatment uh, for menopause wellness. Okay. So for people who are interested in that, they, if they're living in those states, um, then I can prescribe for them. Okay. So those are the areas. So that's how people can reach me. 
Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I tell you what, I know there are probably about a hundred more things <laughs> that we can <laughs> definitely talk about. I would love for you to come back um, at whatever time in okay. that you're available. So I thank you so much for joining us on Promise and Me Unleashed. And I look forward to having you back again. Yes, thanks for having me.